so I'm, I'm glad that Mark did his presentation just before me because it, it makes it, it paves the way and there's plenty of things that I don't have to delve uh, so much into. Uh, now, mm, this paper has seven sections and I'll name the sections as I move from one to the next. And there is an appendix at the end on pages 10 and 11, so we will look at that in time. So like Mark's paper, my, uh, our paper, the, the Bill's and mine, is a hypothesis on the origin of all Chinese pharyngealization, because we don't think that pharyngealization was always there. Uh, so as Mark showed, uh, as Mark said, we reconstruct two sets of uh, pharyngealized consonants, as you can see uh, at the top of page two in that chart. And it should now be obvious to you that there, there are the inventories of pharyngealized and non-pharyngealized consonants are parallel, and in our case, they are phonemic. Uh, so Mark also um, showed what, um, what the reasons are for reconstructing pharyngeals, so I won't I won't go into that. Uh, one thing that's worth mentioning is that Norman's, uh, Norman 1994 uh, regarded pharyngealization not exactly as uh, a characteristic of uh, initial consonants, but as a characteristic of entire, uh, entire syllables. And we think that it is not the case, so we, we took the liberty of modifying Norman's theory a bit by uh, saying that pharyngealization was a feature of the initial consonant of the main syllables. And the reason we did that is because type A and type B words rhyme apparently freely in the old. And if the vowels were pharyngealized, we would not expect them to rhyme. So we pushed pharyngealization left towards the beginning of the words, presumably in the onset. So that's why we have these two, 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 two series. Uh, now, as we observe on pages uh, 73 and 74 of our book, this is typologically unusual, as Mark said. I'm very glad that he showed that it's not so unusual as it seems at first, uh, at first hand. But the, the point is that here, we, we think of typologically unusual features not as impossible, not as impossible characteristics, but as characteristics which, when they arise, do not last long, they're unstable, they, they are tran transient. Uh, they, tend to be, uh, they tend to disintegrate fast. Uh, so the uh, evidence we have for reconstructing pharyngeals dates back to the, really to the end of the old Chinese period or to the beginning of Han times. And that's, so the evidence for pharyngealization can be put at that time, uh, and we have no evidence at all on what uh, pharyngealization, uh, sorry, what, uh, what type A and type B should be at uh, earlier on. Let's now move to section two, uh, where we outline a hypothetical model of how such a contrast may have arisen. Our proposal is spelled out in table two at the top of uh, page three. Table two has two columns, uh, type A on the left, type B on the right, and it's, it's in st three stages. The last stage is the old Chinese stage, the third stage is the old Chinese stage that we, uh, that we reconstruct, and stage two and stage one are earlier stages. So for type B, it's very simple. There's no distinction between, there's no difference between the three stages. The, the, uh, the consonants remain the same all along. So barring, of course, are the changes. <coughs> there's no uh, non-pharyngealized consonants. We assume we're non-pharyngealized at every stage. Uh, and in type A, however, it's a bit different. The, 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 the terminal stage where the pharyngeal consonants arise, we take back to an earlier stage in which you did not have a uh, you, pharyngealization was 
represented by a, an independent segment, a pharyngeal segment, a pharyngeal fricative, ar, which is the ayn of uh, Arabic. So clusters, the difference at stage two, the difference between type A and type B is that type A, uh, type A words begin in clusters of co uh, plain consonant plus a pharyngeal uh, fricative. And that, in turn, goes back to an even earlier stage, stage one, uh, where type A uh, consists of a, a plain consonant followed by a vowel, followed by the pharyngeal fricative, followed by a second copy of the same vowel, and then uh, a possible coda. So, Basically, we suppose that the stage, stage A forms lose the first vowel, then the cluster is formed, and at stage three, the, 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 the pharyngeal consonant influences the, 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 the initial uh, and produces pharyngealized uh, consonants, which may not last for very long. Now, with this reconstruction in mind, let us move out of Chinese into Sino-Tibetan and into the branch of Sino-Tibetan known as Kukichin, uh, including the language Lushai. The Kukichin languages do not have, well, do not have a pharyngealization contrast, but they have another contrast which bisects the entire inventory, the entire lexicon, and that's a vowel length contrast. Some words have long vowels, others have short vowels. And there is a proposal by Starostin in his dissertation in 1989 who claims that there exists a correlation between Lushai long vowels, words with long vowels and Chinese type A words, and Lushai short vowels and all Chinese type B words. That is, cognates. <coughs> when you have cognates between Lushai and all Chinese, they tend to conform to these two, uh, to these two correlations. Now, with the hypothetical model that I have uh, presented in table two in mind, let us look at figure one at the bottom of page three. Figure one has a, uh, two branches, and the root at the top, the root is the ancestor of Lushai and Old Chinese, which we assume to be Kuro Sino Tibetan. So the, the right branch, that which goes into uh, Old Chinese is basically the same development shown in Table 2 that we just saw. Now, how does one go into Lushai? Well, very simply, by losing the pharyngeal consonant between the two copies of the vowel. So that gives you, in fact, a contrast in Lushai between words with short vowels and words with long vowels. Very simple. <coughs> At first sight, it may seem a little cumbersome to reconstruct the two things together, pharyngealization and vowel length. And of course, you, it's easy to derive both. But the, th the point is that similar contrasts exist elsewhere in East Asia, uh, specifically in Proto-Austronesian and in Proto-Austroasiatic. Now, let me first tell you about the Austronesian contrast, and that's, that will be in section four on page four. Now, Austronesian is interesting in that there is a strong preference for disyllables, disyllabic words. Uh, there are almost no, you cannot reconstruct, you can reconstruct almost no <coughs> monosyllabic words to Pro-Austronesian unless they are function words. Content words are not, monosyllabic content words are not reconstructible. There are indeed meaning associated monosyllables in Austronesian, they exist, and you can reconstruct them, but interestingly, they never occur as monosyllables. Presumably because there is something against monosyllables in that language. When they occur, it is either reduplicated or preceded by a dummy syllable <coughs> or prece preceded by phonetic, phonic material that cannot be made sense of. 
Uh, now these, but they, they never occur as simple CVC words. Austronesianists have recognized these for a long time and they call them roots. You can find collections of roots in uh, the works of Blust uh, and John Wolfe, for instance. For instance, uh, one root, suck, S-E-K, S-H-W-A-K, means crown, crowd, something like that. And incidentally, it seems uh, connected with Chinese sai. Uh, now, you cannot reconstruct the form. It's, it's, it's never a free form. You have suk suk to cram crowd in Proto Austronesian. In Proto Malay or Polynesian, which is a branch of Austronesian, you have hasuk to jam, cram, crowd. And forms like besek, dasek, dasek, with, with similar meanings. Uh, but you never have suk all by itself. Now, these forms with, in which you have a root, these monosyllabic words where you have a root at the end and material that you cannot recognize at the beginning, are probably old compounds in which the first part of the compound has become unrecognizable, sort of like cran and cranberry, uh, because of phonetic erosion. Uh, and this, in fact, suggests very strongly that Proto-Austronesian was uh, stress final. Uh, and so that's why roots occur only at the end of words. Otherwise, they might occur at the beginning of words or in the middle of words. Uh, now, in fact, there are a couple of languages where roots occur by themselves without any added material, without reduplications, without dummy syllables without and not in compounds. These two languages, of these two languages, one is in Taiwan, it's Bunun, and one is in the Philippines, it's Cebuano. And the form under which these roots occur in these two languages is pretty much the same. You have the CVC structure of the, of the root emerges as CVVC with a glottal stop between the two V's. Mm. And that looks, a lot like, that looks a lot like type A, Chinese type A. That, at least what we reconstruct as ancestral to, to Chinese type A at Sino-Tibetan level. Uh, for instance, in Cebuano, I, I've cited root suck. In Cebuano, the equivalent, I mean, the, 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 the monosyllabic, this, well, John Wolfe uses a, 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 a term for these forms, C, V, glottal stop, V, C. He calls them stretched. They are stretched monosyllables. The vowel has been stretched, has been geminated, and a glottal stop has been inserted in the middle. Uh, now you can, uh, let's move, uh, moving to uh, page five, and table three at the top of page five. Here you find examples from Bunun. For instance, a word, tak, t -a, -q, a, a root, a monosyllabic root, t-a-q, earth, which occurs with a non-stretched form at the end of disyllables like you see in the second uh, column, like Western Malay Polynesian, buh tak, amis di tak, supo tak, so tak, etc. But in Bunun, the root occurs all by itself in stretched form, ta'ak, and the, the don't stop is actually the option. The other examples are like that. Uh, you also have evidence of this, the same alternation in personal pronouns. Free personal pronouns are stretched, and uh, bound personal pronouns are not stretched. Uh, now, Let's move to section five, bimoraicity in Austroasiatic. In fact, there's exactly, pretty much exactly the same system is found in Austroasiatic as was found, as was observed by Norman Zide in 2002. Zide calls it the bimoraic constraint. Uh, Zide was the first to point out the role of bimoraicity in these, 
in, 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 this, kind, in this kind of behavior. Uh, according to Zide and Anderson, uh, exactly the same system can be reconstructed in to proto austroasiatic And table four gives you examples from four Munda languages, Gutob, Juang, Gorum, and Sora. Uh, the way these languages deal with uh, with roots, with, with syllabic roots, with CVC roots, is that Gutob reduplicates the first CV. Juang puts a dummy syllable, a dummy E, in front of, of it. Gorum geminates the vowel, puts a vowel stop in the middle, and Sora does the same as Gorum, but loses the first vowel, just like, uh, just like uh, stage two in, 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 in figure one. So as they point out, what, what these languages try to do, what, what these languages do is that they have a constraint against monomoraic freeforms. They don't want monomoraic freeforms. They want a freeform to have at least two morae. And they have very, there are various ways in which they can achieve that, uh, that result. Uh, now, our proposal is that the old Chinese type A, type B uh, distinction, and in fact even the Prolo-Sino-Tibetan type A, type B distinction as we, can, as we reconstruct it, goes back to a language, an, uh, a language earlier than Sino, Proto-Sino-Tibetan that had the same construct, that had a bimoraic construct. Uh, how do you go from uh, a language uh, that has the bimoraic constraint to all Chinese? Well, uh, you do that by m making the disyllables monosyllabic, and they become monosyllabic by losing their first consonant. Okay, so you are left, you are left with monosyllables that have no stretching. And then, for the type A words, the stretched, the stretched forms, they evolve as such, as stretched forms, and there has to be one change, which is you have to need, you, you, you need to change the, the global stop between the two vowels into, into a pharyngeal consonant. And I have no uh, explanation for that, it just has to be stipulated. Possibly one could speculate that uh, the languages to the north of Chinese, which have a uh, an ATR versus RTR contrast played a role there. The, the, the distinction, the type A, type B distinction being reinterpreted in terms of ATR, RTR. Now, this model implies one thing. It implies that Starostin's proposal that there is a correlation between type A, type B in Chinese and vowel length in Kukichin is correct. And we have uh, <coughs> attempted to um, test that <coughs> proposal, that hypothesis, uh, statistically. Uh, first, we need to set up a null hypothesis that we <coughs> need to beat. The null hypothesis here is that Starostin is wrong. There is nothing special. There is no particular correlation. There, there, is, there does not exist any positive correlation between Prolokukichin long vowel and all Chinese type A on the one hand, and no particular correlation between Prolokukichin short vowel and type B on the other hand. Uh, unlike Starostin, we do not compare all Chinese type word type with Lu Shai, but with Kukichin, the entire group. And for this, we use Ke uh, Kenneth Van Beek's 2009 reconstruction of Proto Kukichi. Uh, <coughs> there are various benefits in that. Uh, first, the number of forms is more manageable. And second, single language irregularities tend to be ironed out. So, in order to do that, we scanned the Proto Kukichi material <coughs> for Chinese comments. Of course, with some knowledge of uh, phonological evolution, 
both into Chinese and into Kukichin. And we had to exclude a certain, certain sets of words. For instance, we didn't want verbs, because verbal morphology in Kukichin often affects vowel length in ways that we do not understand. So we left verbs out and worked only from nominals, of which Van Bick gives a list. In addition, we excluded open vowel syllables uh, because there is no contrast, there is no length contrast in those in Van Beek's reconstruction. So we left those out. We also left out uh, another, uh, other types of, uh, of forms that I, I leave you to look at the handout to, to, to find out. Of course, we also excluded words that have both type A and type B in China. There are type A, type B variants in Chinese. There are many of those, like, you know, Ru and Na, and uh, many others. And the same in Kukichin. Uh, excluded probable loan words like silver uh, and comparison re comparisons requiring large semantic shifts, like the one I give you at the bottom of page seven. In total, we retained 43 comparisons, which are listed in the appendix. And from these comparisons, we built a table, table five. Now, from the comparisons we have, there are four possibilities. They can, they can fall into four, there are four situations, Chinese type A, Kukichin short, Chinese type A, Kukichin long, Chinese type B, Kukichin short, Chinese type B, Kukichin long. And the, these four uh, situations are the four cells in table five. Now, it's, it is possible using statistics to work out the significance of the deviation from the null hypothesis. And a measure of the significance of that devi deviation is the p-value, p-value. With this type of data, it is possible to compute the p-value out of the four figures in table five uh, using Fisher's exact test. And we set the significance level as uh, 0 0.05, which is the usual significance level in, in, in scientific works. Anything below 0 0.05 is deemed significant. Of course, more stringent uh, you know, significance level of 0 0.01 would be even more stringent, but we selected the 0 0.05 level. 0 0.05, uh, a, a, a p-value of 0 0.05 means that the probability of obtaining the numbers under the null hypothesis is 5%. So anything below 5% is deemed significant. In this case, the p-value is 0 0.032, etc., which means that the probability of obtaining these results under the null hypothesis is about 3.2%, which is low. So at first sight, uh, on present evidence, there probably exists a positive correlation between Kukichin long short and Chinese type A type B, as the Starostin proposed. Of course, we are well aware that uh, other scholars could have found other cognates, and then uh, if that is the case, then it may be necessary in future to modify our list and to recalculate the p value. However, notice that the, domin the predominance of the Colo Kukichin short versus Chinese type B uh, category is very strong, and that probably is going to stay. Now, notice that out of these four, the 43 forms in table five, there are 11 that do not match expectations. I call these mismatches. Now, what is the explanation for these mismatches? The preferred explanation, in our opinion, is that we are not dealing with exact cognates. We are dealing with 
reflexes of two worlds which contain the same root. One of them being monosyllabic, originally monosyllabic, and the other being originally disyllabic. So that would be the explanation for these mismatches. And of course, the same explanation goes for the, uh, for the, ver for, 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 for the variance in, 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 in both in Kukichin and in Chinese. For instance, uh, Ru, in Chinese, Ru, enter, Nup, would go back to a disyllable, syllable Nup, while Na would go back to a monosyllable, Nup at a pre-Sino-Tibetan level. So that's, that's about it, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>